Right, well, for those of you that have uh, jumped into part two, expecting to find out who the murderer is, um, if you haven't watched part one, I'd advise you to do so, because this will make no sense unless you get a context of what happened in the past half hour. Um, we're now going to try and find out just why my beam is not making any sense as it passes through the mirrors. This first mirror seems to have a transmission of about 99.4%, which is extremely good. Um, and so what we're going to do is, first of all, take a look at the beam going in to this mirror. And we're going to do that by... I've attached a piece of... Um, a piece of 8mm acrylic to the front here. And what I'm going to do is do a 5 second burn. It's basically a mode burn to see if we can establish what's happening to the beam as it comes out the tube. As the beam evaporates the acrylic, the acrylic is going to catch fire because there's so much power there. The, the fumes are going to catch fire. So I'm going to have to blow on that to keep the flames at bay. So I'm now running a five second program. The first thing that I see is we've got a nice round beam which is brilliant, but the second thing that I see is that the beam is about 8.5 millimetres diameter. Now I was expecting that beam to be about 6, maybe 6 millimetres diameter. Now that all of a sudden causes me a bit of a problem. I'll explain in a few moments when we get a diagram out, but let's go and do the same thing at the second mirror. Well I think you can immediately see a couple of things. Uh, first of all, it's certainly not as clean a beam. It's got much more burning around the edges, specifically round between about 3 o'clock and 6 or 7 o'clock, much more scorching. And that isn't just because I was blowing the beam that way. OK, we're now doing, we're now doing the same thing at mirror 3. And if you notice what I've done, I've made sure that I, I've got my block approximately central to the black line that's on there, which is the centre of the beam. And I've tried to make it centred that way as well, so we've got a good idea of just how well aligned our beam is. OK, well I think you can see <laughs> clearly that we have a problem. Well now the beam is about 14 millimetres that way which actually is not a problem. And this way, it again is about 11 millimetres, 10.7, 10.8. Now there's something else that we should need to look at as well, which is the depth of penetration. Okay, now here's our three images that we produced. This is straight out the laser and that's quite a nice conical image. The burn is fairly uniform and it's nice and deep and we also established that it was round. Now the second one we can just about see is shallower. It's losing some conicalness and it's in much more of a sort of a bullet shape. And this third one, wow. It's lost all its power. Now, it cannot actually lose its power. What's actually happened is the power has been dissipated over a much larger area so that the energy density is lower and the acrylic has just not evaporated away as much. So acrylic is a very good indicator of energy density. So there's the three images side by side so you can see exactly what's happened. Now the first mirror, although it's 20 millimetres diameter, it's sitting in a little frame so its dimensions get a little bit short. So it probably has only got about 18 millimetres exposed. But because the mirror is laying across at 45 degrees, you know, when something turns at 45 degrees, look, it gets narrower. Well, I hope you can see what I mean about the mirrors. When you look at them, they're very oval. And that's what the laser beam sees. Now, the first thing that we saw was that. 
and we decided the beam on that was 8.5 millimeters diameter. So yeah, there's a pretty fair chance that we shall get that beam in the middle of that mirror and out of mirror number one perfectly okay. So when we measure the power with the doohickey we'll find that what we're getting out of that mirror is the same as what we put in more or less and as we established we had something like 99.4 percent transmission which is brilliant. Now if that picture remained the same all the way through then yes we'd have a parallel beam hitting this mirror and a parallel beam hitting this mirror but that doesn't appear to be the case because by the time we get to mirror number two the beam has changed shape and it could only have changed shape because mirror number one is not flat it's something like that it's got curved edges on it and it may well even be domed in the middle now what that results in is actually a diverging beam and it may actually be worse than diverging it may actually be that we're losing some energy out the side here as well a small amount of energy out the side so what arrives at this beam is not a parallel beam but a diverging beam now when we get to mirror number two I'm going to include the scorch marks because those scorch marks didn't get on this paper for any other reason than it was burnt and so that's part of the laser beam so we've got a beam there almost 12 millimeters diameter now if you remember we've only got a 13 millimeter target to aim at the chances of these two mirrors being perfectly in line with each other so that I can fire right at the center of that mirror is pretty slim there's a pretty fair chance that we've lost some energy out this way and we may well be losing energy off the edge of the be off the edge of the mirror as well and clipping the beam now we've got a beam that's much much larger than it was at this point and it's still getting bigger and we may still be losing some more energy off the side here because of the curvature at the edge of the mirrors because now the curvature of the edge of the mirror is becoming much more into play while it was just across the center it didn't matter too much but the wider we get the more effect the edge of the mirror is having and I know that the edges of the mirrors are curved and so by the time we get to mirror number three my goodness me we are in trouble we've got a beam that's nearly 15 millimeters wide now okay so that's not too bad because 15 millimeters wide we've got an 18 millimeter width there because the mirror has changed direction but what we haven't got is height we've got about 12 millimeters that way so I think we're coming to the conclusion here that although copper mirrors are very very good at transmitting the energy unless I can get them flat they're pretty useless so I think the first thing I've got to do is go back and replace my copper mirrors with the original molybdenum mirrors now <clears throat> my original molybdenum mirrors don't look particularly they certainly don't look as though they've got a very good finish on them and but because they are so hard I don't feel in the least bit worried about giving them a little bit of a polish up because I don't think I shall do any damage to the corners or the edges because they're such a hard material we have three freshly polished mirrors there now for those of you that haven't seen my quick change mirror arrangement um, what I've done first of all I've got a little tool here that I've made and I've got some wing nuts on there and the first thing I do is remove the spring tension with the wing nuts I've got very very long screws in here so I remove all the tension off the springs and then on the end here I've got a little spanner and we can just remove the screws now I 
I'll leave that screw in there. <clears throat> so there's the mirror block off. And I've got just a little tool to remove the screw from the back here. Mirror out. New mirror in. That's the mirror changed. Just get this in the right way up. It's two fixing screws at the top. There we go. <clears throat> so we use this one first. Put that one on. Locate it on its screws. Just tighten that screw up. And we'll put the other two screws in. Just tighten the screws up into the bottom of the hole. Not very tight, just a light pressure. Turn the tool round and we just put the tension back on the springs. And there we go. Mirror changed. And now all we've got to do is just tweak the screws. We need a screwdriver. Not much tweaking required, a little bit of adjustment sideways, a little teeny weeny bit of adjustment up and down, and there we go. So that's two of the three mirrors changed. As I mentioned to you before, if we take this one off now and raise the table, so that the beam comes into focus. In this particular mirror we don't need to do much to it at all because we should just be able to take this one off. Should be able to unscrew that from the top. Take the mirror out. Replace that mirror. And pop that back in. Okay, not a difficult job, and it does look as though I haven't even changed the beam position. But we shall find out shortly because we'll first of all remove the red dot pointer, and then we'll remove the safety tape. We'll put a piece of safety tape over the front there. We'll turn the laser on. And now we do a little pulse test. Oh dear, that's a nice small mark, isn't it? Look. Wow. Righty ho, we'll do this test again. That was what was coming out of the laser, and that's what's now appearing at mirror three. I think you can clearly see that there is not a great deal of difference between those. We have definitely lost some power on this one on the right, as opposed to this one. This is out of the tube, and this is at mirror three. We have lost some, but it's not substantial, and the beam is nicely shaped still. OK, well now we've done the calculations for uh, the molly mirrors, now that we've put them and lived in the mirrors back in, we started off at 71 watts and we lost 3.6 after the first mirror, which is more than the 2% I was expecting. We lost 3.5% after mirror 2. We lost 1.5%, 1.4% after mirror 3, which was pretty good. Um, and then the lens, 
we still lost 7.2% across the lens, which is substantially more than I was expecting. But what we've got to do is look back over the results that we had and say, well, there's a bit of a strange thing going on here because originally this two inch lens when it was first crudely set up was losing us 24 percent. The HQ lens was losing us 40 percent but when we changed it to the ordinary two inch lens it was 24 percent. Without changing the lens it went down to 13.4 percent and without changing the lens again it's gone down to 7.2 percent. So the shape and performance of the beam must be affecting the way in which <coughs> the lens is performing. So what I'm going to do finally, um, I'm going to put my HQ lens, which was the 40.1 rubbish lens, back in and see what power loss I get across that. Okay, well I just put the uh, the HQ lens, the one and a half inch HQ lens back in and uh, well <coughs> instead of giving me 60.4 watts it gave me 50.8 watts so I think that lens is well and truly shot. Uh, I did have another normal one and a half inch lens um, which didn't look too bad and in fact when I popped that in it gave me 60.2 watts compared with that 60.4 watts. So I'm going to leave that one and a half inch lens in while I'm waiting for some new lenses to come. I mean overall it's not that bad. It's not good and I would look to get better than this. I would like to be probably somewhere in the region of about five or six watts loss over the whole of the range, not ten. But you know it's not terrible and it's substantially better than I started off with which is a loss of 33 half the power. <laughs> so I'm now going to test this one and a half inch lens now that it's back up to a reasonable power performance. Okay so I've set my pin table up now um, because I want most of the pieces to fall through. Well I want all the pieces to fall through. This is a very very complex pattern with very very fine detail on it and I don't want the paper to move, not one iota. So we've got a couple of little magnets on there that will just hold the paper in place. Turn the pump on and just we'll have a whisper of air. Okay. Now I've got this set to a speed of about 80 millimeters a second and it's running at 13% power. It's right at the top of this funny impact engraving range where I've got a, a very strange hissy power. Now all the features on this are very very small so even though I've got it set to 80 millimeters a second it will rarely get up to that speed. You can hear it making a real hissy noise as it's cutting.
I'm very pleased that the machine is back in tip-top order. I don't think there is much wrong with the machine, but we've got one more test to perform just to make sure that everything's in order. And that's to <clears throat> bend over, please. And to be fair, I think they look pretty good. So that's our quick final check to make sure that the machine is in good working order. It might not be in maximum efficient order, but I hope that's been a useful exercise for you. Well, I may still invest in some proper copper mirrors from China, just to see how they perform, because if they give me that extra 5 watts that I'm looking for, then I think it might be worth it. And we would certainly never have been able to do anything like this without A, some acrylic to tell us what was going on, and B, a power meter to tell us what was going on. One final thing, in the interests of political correctness, other power meters are available. It's been a bit of an interesting day, uh, and to be honest, I'm rather glad it's over. So, I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Um, it's been a bit boring, a bit long, but uh, at the end of the day, I'm fairly happy that my machine is in reasonable health. Uh, I wish I could say the same for me. See you next time. Bye.